Meeting of the uh, committee will please come back to order. Uh, for the uh, questioning on panel two, without objectioning, without objection, questioning for panel two will proceed as follows. The majority and minority will each begin with a 12-minute block of time with the chairman and ranking member each having the right to reserve time from this block for later use. And without objection, that will be the order. We are pleased to welcome to our hearing uh, for this panel uh, Devin Sharma, who is the president of Standard & Poor's, Raymond W. McDaniel, who is chairman and chief executive officer of Moody's Corporation, and Stephen Joint, who is president and chief executive officer of Fitch Ratings. We are pleased to have you here today. Uh, it is the practice of this committee that all witnesses who testify before us do so under oath. So I would like to ask you to please stand, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, Mr. Joint, why don't we start uh, with you? Uh, I might indicate. Uh, to each of you that your prepared statement will be in the record in its entirety. Uh, what we would request, and we are not going to be very strict on this, but we request uh, that uh, you observe the clock that will give you four minutes, then one minute, uh, four minutes green, then one minute orange, and then when it, after five minutes it turns red and we would like to have you at the end of that time uh, see if you can con conclude your, your testimony. Thank you very much. And there is a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it is pressed. Is it on? I think so. Yes. Since the summer of 2007, uh, the global debt and equity markets have experienced unprecedented levels of stress and volatility. The underlying factors contributing to the uh, credit crisis have been many, namely historically low interest rates, greater global demand for relatively riskier and higher yielding assets, lax underwriting standards in the mortgage origination markets, inadequate discipline in the securitization process, insufficient risk management practices at financial institutions, an outmoded global regulatory framework, and credit ratings in RMBS and CDOs backed by RMBS that have not proven as resilient as originally intended. As I noted in my testimony before the Senate Banking Committee in April, the crisis began with severe asset quality deterioration in the U.S subprime mortgage market and related RMBS and CDO securities that caused large market price declines because ultimate credit losses will be far greater than anyone had anticipated. Today's market stresses, however, have become more broad-based by asset, institution and geography and emanate from a global reassessment of the degree of leverage and the appropriateness of short-term financing techniques inherent in today's regulated and unregulated financial companies. Deleveraging is dramatically reducing liquidity and contributing to price volatility, both for individual securities and for, the sec and for the institutions that own them or insure them. With the benefit of hindsight, it is clear that many of our structured finance rating opinions have not performed well and have been too volatile. We have downgraded large numbers of structured finance securities particularly in the subprime mortgage and CDO areas and in many cases by multiple rating notches. Why is this happening? While we were aware of and accounted for in our models and analysis many risks posed by subprime mortgages and the rapidly changing underwriting environment in the U.S. housing market, we did not foresee the magnitude or the velocity of the decline in the U.S. housing market, nor the dramatic shift in borrower behavior brought on by the changing practices in the market nor did we appreciate the extent of shoddy mortgage origination practices and fraud in the 2005 and 2007 period. These dynamics were magnified in the CDO market. Structured securities are specifically designed for lower rated riskier and therefore higher yielding bonds to absorb losses first. However, radically and rapidly changing markets have led to dramatic rating changes that have affected even highly rated bonds. As we now have learned, building complex, highly tranched securities 
on historical default probabilities does not always provide enough cushion for extraordinarily variable performance. We need to reemphasize the art learned through experience to complement the science of qu quantitative analysis. Reflecting the crisis still unfolding, we began in 2007 to build significantly more conservatism into our analytical approach and as we reassess past ratings uh, or consider rating any new securities. Problems in the subprime mortgage and CDO assets represent a major portion of asset losses and write downs. They are one of the original catalysts for today's financial crisis, but that is not a complete picture. Derivative exposures relating to these assets, but also other assets, have created major stress. Balance sheet leverage is too high for the volatility we are experiencing, and the ongoing deleveraging process is dramatically pressuring markets and prices. Further, the leverage of synthetic exposures that normally is not transparent has become painfully transparent as counterparties lose confidence in each other and require physical collateral to protect synthetic positions. It has been difficult to find balance in assigning ratings to major global financial institutions during this current financial crisis. While the public ratings reflect the fundamental analysis of each company, they do not and have not anticipated completely illiquid markets. In fact, our ratings reflect the expectation that in crisis environments, regulators and governments will support major banks and financial systems. With that in mind, we have continued through recent months to maintain high ratings, mostly AA category, on the majority of the top 25 largest global financial companies, despite market stresses from capital raising, liquidity and profitability, anticipating government support that has been largely forthcoming. Having mentioned some limitations of rating at this point, uh, I feel I should note, however, that Fitch has and continues to produce much high quality research and ratings of value to many investors in many market segments. I recognize the purpose of today's hearing is to focus on the crisis and the problems and hopefully forward moving solutions. So with that in mind, how is Fitch functioning in the market today? We have reviewed our original ratings on entire vintages of subprime and CDO securities and have now find that many were too high. Our continuous goal has been to undertake new analysis that provides investors with our latest opinion about the risk of these securities, even though the result in many cases has been significant downgrades. We have paid special attention to modulate our communication to the importance of our rating decisions. In calmer times, small changes in credit ratings are notable for investors. In today's crisis environment, I have directed our teams to identify important and critical changes in credit quality and immediately bring those forward to the market. Minor changes in quality need to be communicated with balance and proper perspective. Rating changes should not be continuously contributing noise to the crisis, but instead be simple, clarifying gradations of risk or credit strength. Returning to problem mortgage and CDO securities, ratings were designed to identify the relative probability of full repayment of these securities. Today that we expect many junior securities may have significant or total losses. The variance in projected repayment and the related valuation of highly rated securities, AAA, is a critical market problematic. Some may have sizable losses, but many large balanced AAA securities may receive full payment or experience relatively small percentage losses. We are shifting our analytical resources and modeling to provide information to investors and other interested parties, such as the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury, to support greater transparency and price discovery to help finally define and stabilize these asset valuations. To win back investor confidence, our, confidence, our ratings opinions must be more predictive and our research and analysis must be uh, more insightful and forward-looking. Uh, we remain committed to the highest standards of integrity and objectivity. I would like to add one thing to my prepared opening remarks. Having listened to this morning to the panels, uh, I accept that our uh, ratings did not project, as I have described, the full risk in many mortgage-backed uh, and CDO securities. But regarding the question of intent that also this uh, committee is in, uh, discussing, uh, I would like the committee to consider uh, Fitch on the merits of how we have performed as a company 
uh, rather than as on the many colorful things that we've seen this morning from emails and others. I believe that we uh, have operated uh, with very strong intent. I personally have operated with very good integrity, and I believe our culture has supported uh, the effort to operate with good intent and good integrity both. And I'm happy to describe during the questions and answers uh, information that would, in my opinion, would support that conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joint. Mr. McDaniel. Good morning, Chairman Waxman. Uh, is that button on the mic pressed or close enough? There we go. Sorry. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and members of the committee. I'm Ray McDaniel, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Moody's Corporation, the parent of Moody's Investor Service. Moody's is the oldest bond rating agency in the world, having issued its first ratings in 1909. Our company was founded on the great American traditions that encourage and protect the marketplace of ideas. Today, Moody's has 20 offices around the world and employs almost 2,500 people worldwide, including approximately 1,500 people in the United States. On behalf of all my colleagues at Moody's, I thank the committee for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Over the past several weeks, we have witnessed events that have sent shockwaves around the world and undermined confidence in the capital markets. American families are directly affected by this loss of confidence. Many have lost jobs, homes, or retirement savings, and they are suffering. The problems being faced by the financial markets extend well beyond housing and have exposed vulnerabilities in the overall infrastructure of the world's financial system. These weaknesses include exceptional leverage, loss of liquidity in periods of stress, the rapid changes of asset valuations and capital needs, insufficient risk management practices, interlinked market participants, and limited transparency. We believe it is important to consider all of these issues as new regulatory structures for the financial markets are developed. With respect to the rating agencies, many have asked what happened in the rating process that led to large downgrades in the subprime market. As is now well understood, the deterioration of the U.S. housing market began with a loosening of underwriting standards for subprime mortgages. Moody's did observe the trend of weakening conditions. Beginning in 2003, we published warnings about the increased risks we saw and took action to adjust our assumptions for the portions of the residential mortgage-backed securities market that we were asked to rate. We did not, however, anticipate the magnitude and speed of deterioration in mortgage quality or the suddenness of the transition to restrictive lending. We were not alone, but I believe that Moody's should be at the leading edge for predictive opinions about future credit risks, and we have learned important lessons during these fast-changing market conditions. Indeed, I believe that we now all need to consider how to improve the U.S. mortgage origination and securitization process. For our part, we have made specific changes in our processes, including, among others, seeking stronger assurances from the issuers and better third-party review of underlying assets. Beyond the housing market, Moody's believes that the, that the critical examination of our industry and the broader market is a healthy process that can encourage best practices and support the integrity of the products and services our industry provides. Rating agencies occupy an important but narrow niche in the information industry. Our role is to disseminate opinions about the relative creditworthiness of bonds and other debt instruments. At Moody's, our success depends in large part on our reputation for issuing objective and predictive ratings and the performance of our ratings is demonstrated over many credit cycles on the hundreds of thousands of securities we have rated. At the heart of our service is our long-term credit rating system that rank orders the relative credit risk of securities. In the most basic sense, all bonds perform in one of two ways. They either pay on time or they default. If the future could be known with certainty, we would need only two ratings, default or won't default. Because the future cannot be known with certainty, we express our opinions on the likelihood of default on a 21-step rating scale ranging from AAA to C. One common misperception is that Moody's credit ratings are statements of fact or solely the output of mathematical models. This is not the case. The process is importantly subjective in nature and involves the exercise of independent judgment by the participating analysts. Although rating criteria will necessarily differ from one sector to another, we use essentially the same rating process in all sectors. The rating process begins with rigorous analysis by an assigned analyst of the issuer or obligation to be rated, followed by the convening of a rating committee meeting where the, me where the committee members discuss, debate, and finally vote on the rating. Once the rating committee has made a decision, the rating is published and subsequently monitored and adjusted as needed. 
Importantly, the rating reflects Moody's opinion and not an individual analyst's opinion of the relative creditworthiness of the issuer or obligation. In conclusion, we believe in this process but continually strive to do better. For example, as described more fully in my written statement, we are refining our rating methodologies, increasing the transparency of our analysis, and adopting new measures to reinforce and enhance existing processes and policies that address potential conflicts of interest. The Securities and Exchange Commission recently concluded its own extensive examination of the industry and provided us with specific tasks to enhance our services, which we are in the process of implementing. We know that there has been a loss of confidence in our industry. Moody's is committed to working with Congress, with regulators, and with those affected by the markets to do our part in restoring confidence in our industry and in the broader financial system. Thank you, and I will be happy to respond to questions. Thank you very much, Mr. McDaniel. Mr. Sharma? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee, good afternoon. We at Standard & Poor's appreciate the severity of the current disruption in the capital markets and its effect on the economy and American families. As events continue to unfold, the role played by leverage, liquidity, underwriting, accounting policies, and other factors is becoming clearer. Let me state up front that we recognize that many of the forecasts we used in our ratings analysis of certain structured finance securities have not borne out. We have reflected on the significance of this and are committed to doing our part to enhance transparency and confidence in the markets. For decades, S&P's ratings have been and we believe will continue to be an important tool for investors, but it is important to recognize and appreciate how they should be used. S&P's ratings express our opinion about the ability of companies to repay their debt obligations, but they do not speak to the market value of a security, the volatility of its price, or its suitability as an investment. At Standard & Poor's, we employ a number of measures that promotes in independence and analytical rigor. I have described several of these measures in greater detail in my written testimony. Studies on rating trends and performance have repeatedly confirmed that Standard & Poor's ratings have been highly valuable in informing the markets about both the deterioration and improvement in credit quality. That legacy, which is our most valuable asset, has been challenged by recent events. It is by now clear that the mortgage performance has suffered more severely than we had estimated in relation to the stresses in the housing market. However, our estimates and the ratings based on them were the result of a robust analysis of the transactions themselves, our monitoring of markets, our experience in rating these types of securities, and the stress test based on the historical data, including market events going back 75 years to the Great Depression. While we performed the analysis in good faith, events have shown that the historical data we used and our analysis significantly underestimated the severity of what subsequently occurred. Having said that, it is important to put this issue in context. While negative performance no doubt has been significant, 1.7% of the U.S. structured finance securities we rated in the worst performing period, 2005 through the third quarter of 2007, have actually defaulted and about a third have been downgraded. We constantly learn from our experience and we are actively taking steps to improve our ratings process. We announced a series of initiatives earlier this year which I have outlined in my written testimony speaking to the new governance procedures and analytical improvements, data quality and transparency enhancements to the market and education about ratings. Recent attention to our ratings has led to questions about potential conflicts of interest in the issuer pays business model. Of course, the receipt of money from any party, whether an issuer or an investor, raises the possibility of potential conflict. At Standard & Poor's, we have measures to protect against conflicts and are implementing even still more. Indeed, the evidence speaks to S&P's independence. For example, from 94 to 2006, Upgrades of our U.S. RMBS ratings outpaced downgrades by a ratio of approximately 7 to 1. If, as critics claim, we are issuing inflated ratings as a result of the conflicts, one would expect year after year to see more downgrades than upgrades as ratings are revised in light of actual performance. In addition, the issuer pays model promotes transparency 
as it allows us to disseminate our ratings for free in real time to the public at large. One final point, we are taking steps to maintain and strengthen our long traditional professionalism. On that note, Certain emails cited in the SEC's recent examination report are attributable to, this, to Standard & Poor's. The un unfortunate and inappropriate language is used in some of these emails does not reflect the core values at s and and we are redoubling our emphasis on the importance of professional conduct. In addition, during its recent comprehensive examination, SEC staff found no evidence that we had compromised our criteria or analytics to win business. In closing, let me say that restoring confidence in the credit markets will require a systemic effort. S&P is one part of the equation. We are committed to working together with the other market participants, Congress and policymakers, to restore stability in the global capital markets. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. I'm going to start uh, the questions myself. Uh, the gentlemen, you're giving us uh, assurance that while mistakes were made, you're correcting the problem, that uh, there are a few problems in your industry, but your ratings are honest, your methods transparent, and your in internal controls appropriate. That's what I'm hearing from the three of you. And it's really not anything new because, uh, Mr. McDaniel, in 2003 you said rating actions will reflect judicious consideration of all circumstances and that the system is not broken. In 2005, 2005 you said we believe we have successfully managed the conflicts of interest and have provided objective, independent and unbiased credit opinions. End quote. These are the things that we're hearing from you in public over the years. But Mr. McDaniel, behind closed doors, you were apparently more candid because on September 10th, 2007, you had a private meeting with your managing directors. You called it a town hall meeting. And you said the purpose was to speak as candidly as possible about what's going on in the subprime market and our own business. And you told the gathering of senior executives that there are a number of messages that we just frankly didn't want to write down. But a transcript was kept of that hearing, of that meeting, and we have obtained a copy of it. And this transcript has never been um, made public before. According to this transcript, this is what you told your managing directors and why about why so many mistakes were made rating mortgage-backed securities. Quote now, it was a slippery slope. What happened in 04 and 05 with respect to subordinated tranches is that our competition, Fitch and S&P, nut went nuts. Everything was investment grade. It didn't really matter. We tried to alert the market. We said we're not rating it. This stuff isn't investment grade. No one cared because the machine just kept going. Mr. McDaniel, what did you mean when you said that Fitch and SNP went nuts and started rating everything as investment grade? So turn on your mic. There's a button. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Uh, I was responding to a question that was raised in the town hall meeting. Um, and I, I don't recall whether I was repeating a phrase from a question or whether this was uh, uh, independent commentary that I made, um, but what I was uh, discussing more generally uh, was the, the uh, in our opinion, uh, the need during this period to be raising credit enhancement levels uh, or credit protection levels, uh, which we did. And to the extent that that made uh, the credit protection levels um, higher for certain instruments, um, it meant that we might not be rating uh, those instruments. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, that, was, uh, that was part of the story during that period. You were saying your competitors were going nuts and rating everything. You said um, that uh, the, the, the entire credit rating industry was on a slippery slope and um, went nuts when it started to rate everything investment grade. Uh, uh, maybe I should hear from Mr. Joint and Mr. Sharma. This is what 
he apparently was saying about you behind closed doors. Is it accurate, Mr. Sharma? Mr. Chairman, um, there are many instances uh, we have chosen not to rate when either we have believed we, have, we do not have enough information from the issuer or it doesn't meet our criteria appropriately. So there have been many examples and instances, and we'd be happy to provide so that. So you don't agree committee. with his assessment? Uh, you know, as we, we have continued to sort of, as I said, um, there are many instances not rated things. And as I said, there are things so that So sometimes we, you didn't rate. Sorry? So, sometimes you didn't give a rating. Correct. And we, therefore, if you gave ratings inappropriately in other cases, we should, we should take that into consideration. Mr. Chairman, we also make all our criteria public. Okay. It is available to the investor, it is available to the issuers and public at large for them to look at how we rate the well, rational let me, let me get back to the essential issue here because Mr. McDaniel solicited feedback from the company's top managers about that meeting and I want to read what one of the managers said. It's a long quote. We heard two answers yesterday. One, people lied, and two, there was an unprecedented sequence of events in the mortgage markets. As for one, it seems to me that we had, a, had blinders on and never questioned the information we were given. Specifically, why would a rational borrower with full information sign up for a floating rate loan that they couldn't possibly repay? And why would an ethical and responsible lender offer such a loan? As for two, it is our job to think of the worst case scenarios and model them. After all, most economic events are cyclical and bubbles inevitably burst. Combined, these errors make us look either incompetent at credit analysis or like we sold our soul to the devil for revenue or a little bit of both. But Mr. McDaniel, one of your top managers says Moody's was either incompetent or sold its soul to the devil. It's a serious charge. How do you respond? Uh, I think the manager was referring to what the perception could be uh, based on the stress that uh, assets that had been rated in the mortgage-backed securities area uh, were undergoing. Uh, with respect to the comment they lied, I was not referring to anyone at Moody's or, in fact, anyone in the industry. Uh, I was referring to media reports uh, about the uh, deterioration in the veracity of information that was flowing through the mortgage origination process. In other words, people were claiming they could pay back the loan, but they couldn't? Uh, yes. Okay, but that shouldn't be hard to figure out when you have loans that are be given, being given that amount to 100 percent and no equity in the hands of the, uh, of the borrower. Well, one of the, one of the... Wouldn't that be a more likely situation for a default? Uh, certainly to the extent that there is more leverage um, in, a, uh, in a mortgage or in, in uh, the purchase of a home, uh, there is a, a greater risk of default. So uh, people who are lying uh, or, um, or that, um, in effect, uh, you weren't modeling for the worst case scenarios. I I'm trying to reconcile what you've said publicly on a number of occasions, including today, and what you said in a private meeting, and it seems to me you're saying totally different things in public than you're saying in private. In public, you assure us that your industry meets the highest standards, but in private, you're telling insiders that conditions in your industry could lead to a financial crisis. I, I am saying both internally at Moody's and externally to the public uh, very consistently that we seek to maintain the highest levels of, of objectivity independence uh, and professionalism in assigning our ratings. And, and well, I, I know that's that what you're saying groups. here, but it's hard to reconcile the transcript of that meeting. My time has expired, and I want to uh, recognize Mr. Davis. Uh, yeah, I'll just give me five to start. Right now. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, <clears throat> the credit rating agencies have long maintained a fiction that their ratings are consistent uh, across all asset categories. But according to the data published by Moody's in July 2007, we learned that not all credit ratings are created equal. Uh, Moody's apparently found that BAA rated corporate bonds, which is the lowest investment grade Moody's rating, defaulted in an average five-year rate of 2 percent. But CDOs with the exact same BAA rating suffered from an average five-year default rating of 24 percent. How do you explain giving the same rating grades to such wildly different kinds of debt? I asked them. 
Uh, that was uh, uh, research we conducted in order to uh, evaluate, just as you uh, cite, the consistency of our ratings. I think it is important that we do so. That's exactly the kind of research work and self-assessment uh, that we should conduct for our firm. Um, and there were uh, findings that there were higher default rates at the low investment grade level in one sector versus yeah, another I mean, 12 sector. times higher in this case. Uh, at, for, the, for the period in time uh, that was being assessed, that's correct. For other periods of time, we have found uh, that the, that 12 times number, in fact, fell dramatically. And so what part of what we were considering was whether there were issues about the point in time in the credit cycle or with respect to certain types of assets that were receiving those ratings that needed to be considered further. Okay. Mr. Chairman, let me ask you. Chris Cox, who is the chairman of the SEC and former colleague of ours, will be before the committee tomorrow. And he is going to testify that the credit rating agencies sometimes help to design structured mortgage-backed securities so that they could qualify for higher ratings. Now, you testified that Standard & Poor's doesn't do this. How would you respond to Chairman Cox if he were here? And I would like the rest of the panel to respond as well. Mr. Ranking Member, I can only respond for us. We have very stringent policies and practices of, that our analysts will not advise any firm on structuring of deals. Um, <clears throat> though there are instances where when we look at uh, the, the rating anal procedure or process where pe people uh, bring their analysis to us and we opine on that whether it meets our criteria or not. That is the only thing we do is to opine on whether they meet our criteria or not, nothing more. Mr. McDaniel, how would you respond? Yeah, we, um, uh, we do have interaction with issuers and with investors uh, around the credit implications uh, or potential credit implications of securities which they are contemplating issuing into the market. Uh, those uh, discussions uh, should relate solely to credit, uh, and it is in the interest of, one, understanding the information that is being delivered to us to make sure that uh, we reduce the, the likelihood of uh, a misanalysis of that information, and two, communicating back to those parties uh, information that uh, we think may have credit implications for the securities under consideration. So that is the nature of the interaction. Mr. Um, the, the regular dialogue between uh, analysts and anyone working on an issuer or a banker on putting together a financing, is there an iterative process that is, I think, unavoidable? So for our employees to suggest that they become involved in consulting and trying to design securities, uh, that is not part of our approach. That is not part of our business. That is not their job. To restrict them from any interaction, of course, is not also constructive. And so I, I would say it is a back and forth kind of iterative process. But our analyst interaction isn't designed to create securities or create the highest ratings. When Congress passed the Credit Rating Agency Reform Act, uh, we included language that prohibited notching as an anti-competitive practice. Now, as I understand it, notching refers to when one credit rating agency reduces its rating for a particular structured financial asset that incorporates components like subprime mortgage-backed securities that it hadn't previously rated. Some have asserted that notching is a valid technique used by some credit rating agencies to protect their reputations and provide more accurate ratings, but others say that it represents an anti-competitive practice. I ask each of you, is notching an anti-competitive practice and should Congress have gotten involved in this issue and what impact does the prohibition of notching have on the ratings of subprime mortgage-backed CDOs and other risky structured financial products? Go ahead. So if I could address that first, because I think Fitch was involved in suggesting that notching could be an anti-competitive practice and put that uh, proposition forward. So today I would suggest, that, as I did in my testimony, that we have moved way beyond that question. In fact, uh, notching, as referenced then, uh, referred to the creation of securities that now we are discovering the ratings are changing by whole categories not by notches. So, in fact, the reliance on ratings generally and their default probabilities specifically for some of the structured securities, since they have changed so dramatically, as you pointed out, uh, is a relatively small issue, not an important one. The more important one, I think, for rating agencies is to reflect on what is a steady state expectation for these securities that we are now rating, have rated in the past, and that we are trying to change the ratings to make them more active on. Uh, I would say that is our more important mission. 
Mr. Brigame, either of the other have anything to say? Uh, I, I believe it's a matter of intent. Um, I think there are valid credit analytical reasons uh, to notch in, uh, in some cases, and there may not be in other cases. Again, uh, ultimately, it's the responsibility of the rating company of what rating they gave and what the quality is. So ultimately, it's our analytical responsibility to make sure we are comfortable in assuming or making any assumptions. And that's why there may be valid reasons to continue to move on. But let me, I mean, was the, con was the congressional uh, intervention in this appropriate or not? Thank, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all the panelists. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, in 2002, the Senate Government Affairs Committee recommended that the SEC begin regulating credit uh, rating agencies. In 2003, the SEC agreed and issued what they called a concept release that would have addressed conflicts of interest at credit rating agencies. On July 30th, rather July 28th of 2003, you sent the SEC a letter opposing this regulation. In your letter, you claimed that Moody's had dealt with this conflict of interest and I'll read to you exactly what you said. You said, and I quote, the level of ratings are not affected by a commercial relationship with an issuer. Do you remember sending this letter? I, I do remember sending the letter. I don't remember the sentence, but yes, I remember sending a letter. Well, in the letter you made a very strong case that you had vigorous protections in place to prevent your ratings from being affected by your profits. And as a result of your categorical strong assertions, no regulations were adopted. My problem is that on October 23, 2007, you gave a presentation to your board of directors uh, which uh, said, absolutely the exact opposite of what you said publicly and to the SEC. And the committee has obtained a copy of that document. And in that, uh, you described what you called, and I quote, a very tough problem. And under the heading conflict of interest market share, you said, the document says, quote, the real problem is not that the market underweight, underweights ratings quality, but rather that in some sectors it actually penalizes quality. It turns out that ratings quality has surprisingly few friends. Issuers want high ratings. Investors want ratings downgrades. Short-sighted bankers uh, 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 want uh, to game the ratings of the, of, the, of the rating agencies. And you described in this document some of the steps that Moody's has taken to square the circle. But then you said this, and I quote, this does not solve the problem, end quote. So would you like to comment on what you said in this document? And you also said that keeping market share while ma maintaining high quality was an unsolved problem. Uh, does this internal presentation to your board uh, contradict years of public statements uh, to the public and to the SEC by you and other Moody's officials? In public, you said conflicts of interest could be managed. But in private, you said your internal procedures had not solved the problem. And let me read you another passage. You also wrote this, and I quote, unchecked competition on this basis can place the entire financial system at risk, end quote. Uh, to me, this is an astonishing, amazing statement, especially in, in light of what is occurring in the markets now and the pain and suffering of Americans and our economy. What exactly did you mean when you said 
Competition on this basis can place the entire financial system at risk. And how can you sleep at night knowing that these risky pros products that you are giving AAA ratings uh, could put the entire financial system at risk? Uh, first of all, I, I should uh, restate the public comments that I have made previously, which is that our ratings are not influenced by commercial considerations. Our ratings are the basis of, of our best opinion based on the available information at the time. But that is not what you said to your board members. That is not what you said that is not in this document. It is not inconsistent with what I said to my board members. What I said to the board is that it creates a problem that to maintain the appropriate standards creates a conflict potentially with maintaining market share and that that is a, a conflict that has to be uh, identified, managed properly and controlled. I, I think that in raising these kinds of tough questions with my senior management team, with the board and publicly is exactly the job that I should be doing. Uh, but you also said that Moody's drinks the Kool-Aid. And let me uh, quote, analysts and MDs, managing directors, are continually pitched by bankers, issuers and investors, all with reasonable arguments whose views can color credit judgments, sometimes improving it, other times degrading it. We drink the Kool-Aid, end quote. What did you mean exactly when you said we drink the Kool-Aid? Uh, it was uh, a shorthand reference to the fact that communications from individuals may either be uh, more persuasive or less persuasive. They, they may influence our subjective judgments um, as to whether uh, credit quality for an instrument or an obligor um, is, uh, is associated with a well-managed firm or perhaps a not so well-managed firm. Um, and, and I made the comment uh, uh, with respect to the, the potential for those assessments uh, to affect ratings either up or down. Well, I'd just uh, like to conclude by saying in, in public you were saying one thing, in private you were saying another. In public you were saying, quote, the level of ratings are not affected by a commercial relationship with an insurer, end quote. But in private, you were telling your board that this was a huge risk, that Moody's for years has struggled with this dilemma, end quote. And it is hard for me to read this document and believe that you believed what you were saying in public. My time has expired. <coughs> Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. You know, gentlemen, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to, to feel uh, that honesty is coming from that table. I'm trying. But as I listen to you and I think about what has happened to the people in my district, students not able to get loans, businesses closing, seniors going back to work, people suffering. And then I listen to the testimony that we heard earlier. I'm convinced that the financial world, and when I say world, I mean world, worldwide, needed the ultimate trust from your agencies. And I'm afraid to tell you, and I hate to tell you this, but I believe that a lot of that trust has been lost. Whether you is intentional, unintentional, whatever, it's been lost. And Mr. Sharma, in your testimony, you blame the models that you use and your assumptions on how the housing market would behave for S&P's failure to rate the securities accurately. But then Mr. Rader stated in his submitted testimony that part of the rationale for the failure was to, to fail to implement the new model was, one, it was too expensive, two, there was a debate as to whether S&P needed that level of data, and, and three, improving the model would not add to S&P's revenues. Was it any of those? You know, we, we're blaming everybody else for everything, but people are suffering. And I just want to know, what's the deal? I'm listening. Uh, Mr. Member, first of all, um, it, is, it is a severe uh, dislocation that we are all experiencing, and as what you are describing is something that all of us 
feel it. All our 4,000 analysts around the world feel it because it is not without pain that uh, everybody is experiencing and seeing. <clears throat> what Mr. Rader was talking about was two things. One, a model that he proposed or he was part of development when he was there, which many of our analysts tested and concluded it was not as reliable analytically. And so that's why the decision was made not to use it. Second part Mr. Rader highlighted was that the model that he was, he was instrumental in developing, he indicated that may not have been updated. To just give you the fact that since Mr. Rader left, it has been updated eight times, which is about two and a half times per year uh, since he left. So we have been committed to sort of continue to update the models. As the environment changes, we observe the risks changing, we observe what things we need to change a model, and we make the appropriate changes. So we are continuing to make changes, and we have learned from this experience as well. Well, you know, it's interesting. You said something that was very interesting. You said some of the statements do not reflect the core values of S&P. And I guess that includes this statement from Chris Meyer, who uh, says that it doesn't make sense about the CDOs. You, you're familiar with that statement? Uh, he says, doesn't, doesn't it make sense that a, a BB synthetic, <laughs> triple B synthetic would likely have a zero recovery in a triple A scenario? And if we ran a recovery model with the triple A recoveries, it stands to reason that the tranche would fail since there would be lower recoveries and presumably a higher degree of defaults. And then he went on to say that uh, rating, quote, rating agencies continue to create an even bigger monster, the CDO market. Let's hope we all are wealthy and retired by the time this House of Cards falters. It seems to me that there was a climate, there was a climate there of mediocrity. Because when we go on, we, we, uh, we, we realize that there were other people saying the same thing in your organization. Now, although you may not think it reflected the, the culture, I think it reflected the culture, and my constituents think it reflected the culture. And to you, Mr. McDaniel, you know, this is your watch. You made a nice statement about your organization being around since 1909, but I wonder whether the folks who started your organization in 1909 would be happy with what they see today, because there is, without a doubt, there has been a loss of trust. And somebody's got to recover that. You've got to get that trust back. We can never get these markets back, get them back right, unless the investors feel comfortable about what is going on. And you are the gatekeepers. You're the guys. You're the ones that make all the money. You're there. That's why you're there. And so we are, now we face a situation where we've got a house of cards that have, has fallen. And here we are trying to resurrect it. Something is wrong with this picture. And I read the testimony. I understand all the things that you say you're going to do. But you know what the problem is? Once you lose trust, nobody believes you're going to do it. I see my time is up. You want to comment? Anybody? Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit, gentlemen, if I can, about rate uh, shopping on that. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit in the prior uh, panel that was up here. There's a document that we have, an email uh, dated March 21, 2007, by an individual named Gus Harris, who was a managing director at uh, Moody's, Mr. McDaniel. Um, he sent this to several of the other officials at your company, and in it, he accused or complains that Fitch is using more lenient methodology to award higher ratings and steal away business from your company. Uh, this is what the, uh, what the email says exactly. We have heard that they, meaning Fitch, had approached managers and made the case to remove Moody's from their deals and have Fitch rate the deals because of our firm position on the haircuts. We have lost several deals because of our position. Now, I think we have to explain a little bit of the industry jargon here. A haircut, as I understand it in the jargon, is if you saw some uncertainties with the underlying uh, value of mortgage-backed securities, you'd require some additional collateral. And it was that additional collateral that was referred to as haircuts. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And apparently what he's saying is that Fitch, uh, when they find those uncertainties, they don't require the additional collateral. Uh, they just uh, proceed with the deal so they're able to give the higher rating without that so-called haircut. Uh, 
Were you losing business to Fitch, or was Fitch poaching on your business on those types of premise? Uh, with, with respect to um, the specific comment made by Mr. Harris, uh, I, I do not have any, um, uh, any detailed information about uh, uh, his comments. I'm sure he was identifying information that he had, had seen and was communicating what he believed, but I, I don't have specific information. Was on that an isolated incident where others in your company making mention to you that they thought that Fitch or one of the other rating companies was making overtures to your clients uh, in competition trying to steal accounts? Well, I, I uh, would acknowledge that uh, ratings coverage, uh, probably for all of the rating agencies, um, uh, waxes and wanes. We have different points of view about different industries, different sectors. Um, sometimes we feel uh, more confident about a sector than our competitors. Sometimes we feel less confident about a, a sector. Uh, and the, the consequence of that is that uh, issuers of securities uh, may seek ratings from, from one or, or more agencies that uh, has but more do the rating agencies the seek out the, uh, the issuers? That's what I want. Have you ever gone, or anybody in your company ever gone to an issuer and suggested that you ought to replace one of the other rating agencies because you have a more lenient standard? Uh, I have never done that, and I'm not aware of anyone doing that. Mr. Joint, the, uh, Mr. Harris says that your company was doing that with respect to Moody's. Uh, is your company, uh, anybody in your company ever gone to a, an issuer and said, uh, we have a, a different standard here than Moody's does, you ought to switch over to us? Uh, I'm sure our business development people would have contacted issuers, bankers, or investors and suggested they should use Fitch for their ratings. Okay. I would like to think, and I I believe that they would have approached that by saying we have better quality research, a better model, a better approach, more information. So, Mr. Harris I, seems to think they had a different approach. Right. I might also add uh, uh, separately that uh, in the subprime area in particular, uh, our market share was significantly lower than the other rating agencies. That to me wouldn't be evidence of the fact that we were the most liberal rating agency. And in addition to that, uh, almost the majority of the ratings that we assigned in subprime were third ratings. So we weren't replacing anyone, and which to me was always evidence that someone was adding our rating, not so much for the rating, but because they valued our research, our model, our pre sale reports, and other things. Do any of you gentlemen believe that we, uh, we ought to talk about the fact of, uh, of not allowing issuers to actually pay the, the uh, rate setters, that we ought to go to a model that allows for the investor to make the payments and, and not the issuer hire the uh, company? But you know, my personal view is that uh, the reason this developed that issuers are paying was from the Penn Central period and there was not enough uh, analytical talent uh, following the fixed income markets. And because of that, the whole industry, meaning bankers, investors, and I think the government as well, got together and suggested that an issuer pay model handled well, which it could be handled, uh, was more supportive of the people, talent, and money that was needed to cover these markets. Do you believe that, that is still true? I still do. Mr. McDaniel, do you believe that is true? Uh, with respect to issuer versus investor pay model, I think the biggest mistake uh, we could make is, uh, is uh, uh, believing that an investor pay model does not embed conflicts of interest. Uh, so long as rating agencies are paid by any party with a financial stake in the outcome of our opinions, and that includes investors uh, and issuers. Um, there are going to be pressures. And, and so the question is not are there conflicts of interest. There are. It's managing them properly and managing them with enough transparency that regulatory authorities uh, and market participants uh, can uh, conclude that, in fact, those conflicts are being handled to the right professional standard. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDonald, I'm going to follow up on uh, McDaniel. I'm sorry. I'm going to follow up on the last statement you made. You, you, the la second last word you said was transparency. Uh, what's the transparency of your evaluation models? Uh, the transparency of our, our evaluation? Your, your analytical computer modeling. Oh, yes. How much transparency will I find in yours or the gentleman to your left and right? Uh, we publish um, all of our methodologies, um, uh, and uh, those are available on our website for the general public. Uh, the methodologies include uh, a description of models uh, that we use, uh, as well as qualitative um, subjective factors that may be considered in rating committees on an industry by industry basis. Okay, well, let, let me ask a question because uh, I've started looking at Berkeley and, and other sort of software models that are saying, look, you can evaluate, at least today, where we went wrong. 
And, and I've ha I have an observation that I'd like you each to comment on, and that was pick a date anywhere from the first uh, a derivative problems that occurred that led to lawsuits in 01, 02, 03, the early indications, but let's take, let's say, 06 and beyond. Why wouldn't your models have picked up because they're historic models, and you can't, you can't, you you have to weight a historic model both on total number, but also on any significant change. Why wouldn't we have seen a dramatic change in ratings of whole classes occur in a relatively short period of time, as soon as home prices peaked and began falling? And uh, Mr. Kucinich isn't here right now, but I. I am particularly sensitive to that because at the very beginning of this Congress two years ago, we went to Cleveland and got an earful on the foreclosure rate, on the walkaway rate, on the problem. So uh, maybe each of you could respond to that because to me that is the most important question is why didn't your models pick it up in real time and why do I believe your models today if they couldn't pick it up close to real time then? Uh, from uh, from Moody's perspective, one of the one of the interesting um, uh, uh, early developments in the in the current problem that we've seen in the mortgage area uh, was that uh, the monthly performance data, uh, which we began to receive from the 2006 vintage and then the 2007, tracked very closely to what we had seen in 2000 and 2001 in the previous recession, almost exactly on top uh, uh, would be the way our analysts would describe it. Meaning that the tip of it looked just like the previous event. I, I, exactly. And, and as a consequence, um, we did not um, uh, move as quickly as we would have if the early data indicated a shift compared to the prior recession that we had been in. So there was a several month lag. Uh, until we were able to see enough data to see that, in fact, it was not tracking uh, what had occurred in the last recession, uh, because those, those securities were certainly robust enough to withstand the kind of recession that we saw in 2000, 2001. Do all three of you believe today that your models have been improved such that the same event or substantially similar event or even a, a sneakier event, if you will, would not catch your models off guard the way these did? Uh, I, I believe we have introduced uh, significant conservatism into the models now, and uh, we need to be thinking forward because if we are asked to rate new transactions today, that is starting the beginnings of a new, new cycle or a new process. So, mm -hmm. so I think there were changes in terms of the magnitude of the stressors that we have introduced that were greater than we would have uh, used in the past. And then the evidence and information of uh, delinquency and loss in mortgage and then re-reflected in CDOs is far greater than it ever was in the past. So the prior experience of very good structured finance performance from the last 15 years is going to be supplemented by quite poor performance that needs to be modeled. Well, let me ask one, and I'm very concerned because I see whole other classes of debt that are likely, if we don't pull out of this recession that we're heading toward, likely to repeat what we have already seen, and I don't yet see it completely in your models. I see paper that is rated better than to be trading at 60 cents on the dollar of its face value, and yet it is trading that way. Let me just ask kind of a closing question. You are essentially all unregulated industries, you as rating organizations. And from the dais, there will undoubtedly be a call to look over your shoulder in, in, in significant ways. Do each of you believe on behalf of your companies, but also on behalf of an industry you belong to, that a blue ribbon panel or commission that was independent of politics uh, would be appropriate as an in-between step of what might originate from the dais if we didn't take that in-between step? So, uh we are regulated by the SEC to whatever degree, and they have started examinations in a more forceful way, having, I think, direct, been directed by Congress in that direction. So uh, I do think that the only important uh, protective uh, element is our judgment and our ratings judgment. So if the oversight from regulatory bodies or uh, some kind of panel has to do with process, procedure, and those things, then I think we are open to that, at least at Fitch. I don't speak. I don't want to speak for the industry on sure. that. Sure, I don't no, see I get, I, that I guess way. I get a big chunk of the industry if each of you is able to answer. Uh, I would uh, just add that, uh, in addition to the U.S., we are 
uh, regulated in various jurisdictions around the world. Um, and so uh, while I would agree with Mr. Joint that uh, to the extent that there is a review of, of process as opposed to uh, our ability to develop independent opinions, I would be supportive of that. And I would hope um, that such a review would be able to, to uh, accommodate the global nature of the work that we do. Mm. Uh, yes. We would agree also, uh, given um, an SEC has come up with more rules and, and uh, guidelines for oversight of our processes, and, and I think it's moving in the right direction. More transparency we put around these things, uh, it's better for the whole marketplace. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know this is going to particularly make us look forward to seeing Mr. Cox tomorrow. Chairman Cox, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ice. Uh, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, I want to ask you, uh, in continuing with uh, Mr. Tierney's line of questioning, I want to ask you about the problem of uh, rating shopping. And uh, we've heard testimony from, from former employees of, of your firms in, in some cases and uh, others uh, uh, outside of this hearing that uh, this occurs when investment banks take their mortgage-backed securities to various credit rating, credit rating agencies to see which one will give them the highest rating. And uh, for the rating agencies, this creates incentives for lenient rating systems, and there is a financial incentive to beat your competitors by lowering your standards uh, and offering higher ratings. In essence, it's a, it creates a race to the bottom. Uh, there's an interesting example here, and uh, we have an email that I'd like to have put up. Um, it was sent on May 25, 2004, and it was from one of the managing directors. This is not a, a lower employee. This is a managing director at uh, Standard & Poor's to two of the company's top executives. So this is at the very top level of uh, of the organization. The subject line of the email is competition with Moody's, and it says this, quote, we just lost a huge Mizuho residential mortgage-backed securities deal to Moody's due to a huge difference in the required support level. A little further on, the Standard & Poor's official explains how Moody's was able to steal the deal away, in his opinion, uh, by using a more lenient methodology to evaluate the risk. He says this, again, a quote, they ignored commingling risk and for the interest rate risk, they took a stance that if the interest rate rises, they'll just downgrade the deal. It goes on. Uh, and let me read the rest of the email, and you get the, the back and forth here. Uh, after describing a loss to Moody's, the S&P manager director writes, this is so significant that it could have an impact in the future deals. There's no way we can get back in on this one, but we need to address this now in preparation for future deals goes on. He says, I had a discussion with our team leaders, sort of like what you were describing a little earlier, Mr. McDaniel. I had a, a discussion with team leaders, and we think that the only way to compete is to have a paradigm shift in thinking, especially with, with the interest rate risk. So you can see this back and forth. They steal the account. They lower their standards. Now, now uh, Standard & Poor's is lowering their standard. And, you know, it's, it's fairly evident. It, it speaks for itself. Uh, but Mr. Sharma, what was your manager director referring to when he said this is so significant that it could have an impact on future deals and that the only way to compete is to have a paradigm shift in thinking? Congressman Lynch, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there, so I cannot speak to the specific uh, uh, wording in this email, but I, what I can tell you is that in this case, I, don't, I believe we did not rate this deal. And, and I'm sorry, say that last part again? He did not what? We did not rate the deal. We did not rate the deal. Yeah. No, I'm talking about the exchange here. It, it's, it's not, I'm not interested in, in, in entering this as a, as a legal act. I'm interested in, in evaluating this a, as a document that speaks for itself. This is a present recollection sure. of your management, okay? And, and as long as you can read English, you can pretty much figure out what's going on here. This is not, this is not, uh, this is not you know, we're not, uh, evaluating a, a CDO here. This, this indicates intent, and then we know that, that each firm has modified their, their approach here in lowering their standards. So I'm asking you from that standpoint, from a, just from a common sense standpoint, uh, what, what you get from, from these statements. Yeah. Uh, our criteria is public, as I believe is our um, other firm's criteria is also public. So from time to time, our analysts do look at the criteria for the other firms to see, w have we captured things right? Are they capturing other things that we are not capturing? 
And so there is a, a look at the competition to see what are we doing, what are we not doing. And so I would imagine that this was sort of referring to looking at the competition's criteria and analytics and thinking and looking at seeing if we were missing something that we should be considering. That's what I would suggest. But he's saying they, they didn't add something. They, didn't, they, they basically ignored commingling risk. And for the interest rate risk, they took a stance that, hey, if the interest rate rises, they'll just downgrade, downgrade the deal. Yeah. So uh, he's not stealing good ideas here. He's not, he's not being innovative here. He's just ignoring uh, you know, some, some important factors in the deal in order to, to give them a higher rating. And, and, and by doing so, he's lowering his standards. So we're not talking about competition by innovation. We're talking about competition by uh, Sergeant Schultz, basically ignoring uh, what's going on, looking the other way. As I said, sort of, it, uh, all I can speak to is the intent was to look at analytically, are there things that we are not considering or okay. we are considering that we should be looking at it differently? My, my that was the intent. Mr. McDaniel, just, uh, I mean, this, they're talking about a managing director at Standard & Poor's and says that, you know, they ignored key risk in order to win business. You, you have any response to that? I, I'm, uh, I do Mike, not. Uh, turn your microphone on, uh, Mr. Uh, McDaniel. Turn your microphone on. Uh, it is. Sorry. Um, uh, I cannot speak to this specifically, but uh, certainly we are not going to ignore um, uh, issues or, or topics that have credit implications. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what the, the concern was from a member of another rating agency. Thank okay. you, Mr. Lynch. Your, your time Thank you, Mr. Is up. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Gentlemen, um, I guess around 06, the prime, subprime mortgage securities uh, made up about $100 billion out of uh, 375, almost four, about a quarter of, uh, of CDOs. Uh, sold in the United States. Uh, please help this committee understand how when you have a quarter subprime that the rating agencies can qualify those securities um, um, as AAA when they are backed by very questionable mortgage arrangements. One quarter of them were subprime. Does that is, is that the industry standard? And, you know, we kept seeing these, these subprime always being sort of packaged, but they were going at a pretty high percentage. 25 percent is a pretty big package. Was it just the perception that real estate never goes down, never have to worry about it, and payback is, will always be automatic because you can liquidate the asset? Uh, no, it, it's. Um it's not that at all um, at Moody's, and frankly, I don't believe it's that way elsewhere in the industry either. Um, we know that that subprime mortgages are um, going to have poorer performance than prime mortgages. Um, that's why uh, higher levels of credit protection uh, are associated with those transactions. Um, in the subprime uh, mortgage-backed securities area, for example, uh, those that 2006 vintage. Uh, when we analyzed that, um, we analyzed it to a level at which, uh, uh, in a pool of 1,000 mortgages, uh, approximately 500 could default, uh, and the AAA bondholders would still receive their payments in full. Uh, so um, uh, the, the point is there, was, there were large amounts of excess protection uh, built in to protect the AAA bondholders. Um, and we will have to see whether those AAA bondholders, in fact, suffer credit losses in the future. And that uh, question is still open. Are we, when we're talking about this whole rating shell game, and that's, that's what it appears to a layman, um, are we talking really about the fact that the cost of insuring is, is determined by, your, by the rating? Is that what we're really talking about, the overall insurance and the different rating, the ratings affecting those insurance rates? That's where I understand the question. No, sure. Well, let me, let me, the biggest concern I've got here is that the credibility of the process has definitely 
been decimated over the last few months. If you were going to change the system of having ratings, the rate, basically the, the, the rating system upgraded, everybody's talking about the conflicts that exist now. How would you negate those conflicts or minimize them so that there was more nexus between true rating and a sensitivity there and the, product, and the protection of the market? Because a lot of people are talking about things that went wrong. What would you do to change a system to make it work better? If I had one thing um, that I would recommend to do, it would be to, to make sure that there is sufficient information, not in the hands of just the rating agencies, but in the hands of the investing public, that they can make informed investment decisions about these securities without having to rely solely on rating agencies. Uh, the problem with having insufficient information available to the investing public um, is that they become more reliant on rating opinions, and those are, they are just opinions, and they also have less ability to differentiate the performance of the rating agencies because they can't look at the underlying information and make their own independent judgments about the work. That, that would be my principal recommendation. Transparency. Of the underlying information, yes, absolutely. Gentlemen, you agree with that? Absolutely, and, and that's why we've made a commitment to continue to not only increase transparency through more analytics, but also, as Mr. McDaniel said, more underlying information, but also more information around our assumptions and the stress test scenarios that we do. Uh, Mr. Mr. Member, you said um, that we were looking at house pricing, uh, about house pricing. The fact is, all of us look at house price declines. The only difference was in this case, unfortunately, we did not assume as severe a house price decline as has as occurred. So the more we can make those assumptions clearer to public, to the investors, so they understand what stress test scenarios we are looking at and how extreme they are, the better and more informed decisions they can make about their investments. So what we've had is where the, the consumer, basically, the, there was a perception, here's a rating, and we're not allowed, we can't look beyond that to find where that, that number came from. And then we're told, but buyer beware. And frankly, the perception was it was almost worse than having none at all because there's a false sense that that rating was, was legitimate and could be trusted when, in fact, you weren't allowed to be able to go back and look at the data that justified that rating so that you, you had a confidence with it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to start by posing a question that I want each of you to answer uh, with a simple yes or no. Um, have you or any officials in your company ever knowingly awarded a rating that was unsupported or unjustified in order to win a deal or keep from losing one? I'm just going to go right across the line. Mr. Joint? Not that I'm aware of, no. Mr. McDaniel? I'm not aware of any situation. Mr. Like Sharma? That. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. All right, that, well, the documents that the committee has received and the testimony from the first panel suggests that uh, your analysts did give unjustified ratings. And let me ask about one of these documents. Uh, during the first panel, I uh, discussed an internal instant message that uh, was a conversation between two S&P officials on the afternoon of April 5, 2007. Uh, from the documents, we know these were two officials in the structured finance division of S&P, and it took, uh, this was a discussion about whether they should uh, rate a certain deal. The conversation quickly, once again, you probably are aware of it. Uh, official one, that deal is ridiculous. Official two, I know. <laughs> Right, model definitely does not capture half the risk. Official one, we should not be rating it. Official two, we rate every deal. It could be structured by cows, and we would rate it. Official one, but there's a lot of risk associated with it. I personally don't feel comfy signing off as a committee member. Mr. Sharma, um, do, is this one of the conversations that you referred to in your testimony as containing unfortunate and uh, inappropriate language? Absolutely, Mr. Member. And let me, let me uh, also clarify uh, the full context of the email, if, if, as, as that could be made available, would show that our analysts were referring to the bank models, not to our models, but to the bank models. So the bank bankers submit their models. We, our analysts concluded it was not including enough of the risks that they should have been including. And so that's what they were talking about. It was the bankers' models, and that's what they were talking about. And, and, um, and uh, but you know, it was only part of the email that came out. Uh, well, I understand that that may have been the case, but um, 
the S&P ended up rating it anyway, in spite of the, the questions that your analysts, your officials raised about it. Yeah. Two things, uh, Mr. Member, again, the A, the model was modified. Two, it was uh, more referring to the CLOs, and the CLOs to date are still doing okay. Well, I'm not sure that that, I mean, you, you have officials who said they're not comfortable signing off on it, right. that they didn't model the risk, but yet, your company rated it. But uh, again, um, they were not comfortable as the model was. So they were basically asking the bankers' models to be refined and redefined to include the whole risk. And when it was redefined as the whole risk, then they did rate it. And as I said, it was for, for the CLOs, which are still performing uh, to the normal expectation that we had. It sounds pretty suspicious, and I, but I don't well, want to. Uh, Mr. Member, we are happy to share more facts on that with thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd appreciate that. And, uh, I don't we'll hold the record open to receive more information. Sorry? From, Sorry? We'll hold the record open to receive more information from you. Uh, we focus, I focused that question on, on you, Mr. Sharma, but the problems aren't limited uh, to S&P. There was a New York Times article earlier this year that, uh, that reported that Moody's gave one of its analysts a single day to rate a security that comprised uh, almost 2,400 subprime mortgages worth $430 million. I mean, there's seems to be no way that you could do an effective job of rating a portfolio that large in one day. Mr. McDaniel, would you like to comment on that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I, I have to say I don't know um, what the New York Times was referring to, so uh, uh, I have to answer this in the abstract. Um, but to the extent that uh, a transaction had already been reviewed for its structure, um, that we had looked at uh, the assets underlying the transaction, and we're, we're simply uh, running those assets in, in uh, a computer-ready form uh, through a model so that we could take them to a rating committee. It, it may be possible that that could be done uh, in a day. Um, as I said, I, I can only answer that in the abstract, though, because I'm not sure what that was referring to. But you, you think you're, you're basically saying that a, a hypothetical, let's make it a hypothetical portfolio of that, could be evaluated with sufficient uh, scrutiny that uh, it, would, it would form a reliable basis for making an investment decision with somebody else? Uh, it depends on, on whether other aspects of the transaction had already been analyzed and taken care of and whether we were simply looking at the pool of, of mortgages that had to be, uh, to be assessed uh, uh, with the assistance of uh, uh, computer tools. Let me ask you one other question. And you responded in relation to uh, Congresswoman Maloney's question of trying to reconcile those two statements, the public one and the private, the one to your, your in, internal communication. Uh, the implication to me, if I, if I accept your explanation, which I'd, I'll be happy to accept it, is that, there, um, that the other rating companies are doing something that's not cricket. Is that what you meant? What I, what I um, uh, meant and what I have discussed with uh, our board and our management team is there are you know, difficult issues that have to be reconciled in this business in doing the proper job. I think every business has, has those kinds of challenges. But that, that comment was, was related, to, seems to me, specifically to the competitive situation in your field. The, the so you're talking, you've got 90 percent of the business sitting at that table. And so, I mean, I can't take that, your explanation any other way that you think one of those other two is, is basically doing something that doesn't meet the standards that you have. As I said earlier, um, we have different points of view about different securities, different sectors, industries, uh, in different geographies. And it is inevitable that we are going to hold different views, some of them more liberal and some of them more conservative than our competitors. Um, those have competitive implications. And we have got to be cognizant and candid and discuss those issues in order to keep our eye on the core of our business, which is a standards business. We can't hide from that. We have to address it. Thank you. I've got to yield myself uh, three minutes here because what you're saying is not what you said. What you're saying now is not what you said then. Uh, would you put that to three minutes? Because you, your words were uh, that the your accusation was about these other companies. You said you, you, they were placing the entire credit rating industry on a slippery slope. And you said that they are going nuts and they are starting to rate everything investment grade. 
That's not the same as your interpretation of it now. I, I apologize. I may have misunderstood. I thought you were asking about my communications with our board uh, of directors, and, and I think this was a communication on the town hall meeting. But um, to, to answer the, the question on the town hall meeting, again, I believe I was responding to a question um, that, uh, that had to do with, with standards and the, the challenge. Um, of, of maintaining standards, especially in good times, uh, when the marketplace not, may not uh, uh, be as, as attentive uh, to identified risks. Well, the other thing I can't understand now that's just interpretation of words that sound pretty clear to me is, Mr. Sharma, you said that if we can get that colloquy up of the two officials, where one guy said the deal is ridiculous, the other one said, I know, right? Uh, model definitely doesn't capture half the risk. The other one said, we should not be rating it. And then the answer to that was, we rate every deal. It could be structured by cows and we would rate it. That doesn't sound to me like a discussion of perhaps we can have a reevaluation of it and find out through another modeling that it does deserve rating. It sounds like a statement by one of the people who works for you that said, we rate everything. Even if it were, as he said it, Structured by cows, we would rate it. How do you explain uh, Mr. That? Chairman, first of all, there was an unfortunate um, uh, the inappropriate language used. So no, it's not inappropriate I, I at all. And maybe it's more honest than what we're hearing but, from you and others today. But as I was uh, sh sharing with the congressman before, um, the full context of emails would highlight that they were referring to the bankers' models. And, and the fact is that, that we did ask the more risks to be considered than the models were originally proposed in the, by the bankers. So the, this is exactly what we want our analysts to do, is to challenge and, and, and raise questions when they don't feel comfortable with. One, one man is saying, I don't feel comfor comfortable rating this. I don't think it deserves any kind of rating. The other man is saying, both working for you, you kind of rate it. We rate everything. Yeah. Uh, we rate everything. Even if a cow structured it, we would rate it. That doesn't sound to me like, we could rate it if it had a different model. It sounds like, don't give me any trouble, we're rating everything. Mr. Chairman, again, we make all our criteria public, and then when we rate to it, we make it very transparent to the investors and to everybody else. What do you make transparent? Our criteria against which we rate. So that is publicly available, and when we do the ratings decision, we make the rational as to why we concluded the rating also very transparent to marketplace that says, here's the criteria, here's how we rate it, Here's yeah. the rational. I guess how, it's hard to understand how transparent it is when you don't even go back and look at the underlying securities upon which this whole house of cards is based. Yeah. We, we do uh, have made that commitment to continuously look for more underlying loan and securities. If I might just mention, the SEC staff, in its examination of us, um, while these emails were brought out uh, and they were in, unfortunately new, inappropriate, they did not find any misconduct even in this case that they examined. Well, it's hard to find misconduct because there's no standard for misconduct. I, I, my time is up. Uh, Mr. Issa, did you want some of the time? I will. How much time do you wish? Uh, uh, you I'll have take, six minutes. I'll you, take three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try and hit just a couple of quick points. Uh, first of all, are all of you familiar with the Superior Bank failure and River Bank failures? Um, uh, no. No, I'm Both not. occurred in the early 2000s. Both were subprime loan lending related. Uh, hopefully you, you'll become familiar with them so that your companies can look and say, why didn't our model pick up these significant failures related to subprime in that earlier recession you talked about? Because whole banks went down because they were excessively invested in this type of instrument. And I think that should have been a warning that didn't fit into your models. And you may want to, to look at the question of, uh, and it's, it, it's a little bit like I mentioned airplanes one time in a hearing and I lost people, but you know, an airplane can fly precisely all the time except the one time it crashes. It doesn't do any good to say it had 10,000 good hours. If every, if every 10,000 hours a plane falls out of the sky, Boeing would be out of business, McDonnell Douglas never would have gotten, so to speak, off the ground you have to have a much better capability to deal with when something goes wrong, if you will, a failure that doesn't lead to a crash. So I, I, I'll just leave you with that. I don't want to go further into it other than to say there were indications eight years ago 
that subprime, these now called toxic loans, uh, could lead to catastrophic events. I want to put you on the spot, though, today as to the, the uh, overhang of the LBO market. We have been talking, and, and people are implying here that if you take somebody's money, you automatically do their bidding to their preference. It, it, I find it a little interesting that members of Congress pride themselves on taking a million dollars every two years from people who want us to do certain things, and then we often, rightfully so, vote against their interest. And, and somehow we can't see that we are asking you to do substantially the same thing as an organization. Uh, but having said that, we have hundreds of billions of dollars, probably several trillions, I don't have the exact number, in these leveraged loans that corporations did. Uh, they are still on the books. They are trading at 50 and 60 cents, even if they are fully performing. How do you view your ratings today as predictive of, of whether or not these are going to become non-performing, particularly, and I go back to what was said on the other side of the aisle, particularly when you have indexing of two points or more, actually 11 over LIBOR, if you bust a covenant today, would probably be what you would get. With those kinds of increases, it would evaporate the ability to repay a loan. How do you see that and how are you rating them so that we can understand with confidence that those trillions aren't going to need a bailout from Washington? So uh, speaking of most highly leveraged companies that would have the leveraged loans that you are referring to, probably their ratings are speculative grade today. Probably the original ratings were not highly rated or investment grade. But I take your point well that uh, in this kind of environment, I think, uh, companies that thought they would have stable cash flows that have introduced tremendous leverage into their business are much more susceptible to failure. So I think we need to be addressing the ratings on those, although they are already speculative grade, uh, by moving them down. But uh, I think it is more important that, uh, that we find a way or the management of those companies finds a way to reduce the leverage, especially in this environment. Uh, we expect that the uh, default rates for uh, these uh, highly leveraged corporations are going to rise in 2009 and 2010. Um, we do have them uh, uh, graded in the speculative grade range, many of them in deep into the speculative grade range. Uh, but I agree with Mr. Joint that uh, the, the ability of these companies to, to uh, delever um, or access capital uh, in a very difficult market is going, to be, is going to be very important to the ultimate default rates we see in this sector. I agree with Mr. Joint and Mr. McDonnell. We also, for example, most of the ratings are speculative grade, and our average default rates for them were 1 percent, and we are now projecting it will go as high as 5 to 6 percent, which will you know, put more strains and pressures. And the deeper the economic recession, the greater the risk. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, today I have been listening and we have been hearing stories of culpability, incompetence, and, in my opinion, corruption. This member of Congress has downgraded your AAA rating. Your industry and financial system is based on trust. A former Moody's analyst is quoted by Bloomberg.com last month saying, and I quote, trust, is a trust and credit is the same word. If you lose that confidence, you lose everything, because confidence is the way Wall Street spells God. Mr. Chair, in the last few weeks, we have seen what happens when Wall Street loses religion. Mr. McDonald, in 2005, you testified before the Senate Banking Committee, and I want to quote you. You said, Moody's integrity and performance track record have earned the trust of capital participants worldwide. Mr. McDaniel, documents obtained by the committee tell a very different story. On July 10, 2007, Moody's downgraded over 540 mortgage-backed securities and placed 239 for possible downgrade. The committee has an email that was sent two days later on July 12. This email says that Fordyce investors raised concern with your organization. Publicly, you say you have the trust of the market, but privately, many market participants say they don't have uh, trust in your ratings. Now, here's a few of the quotes from the email. Quote, if you can't figure out the loss ahead of the fact, what's the use of using your rating? Another quote, you have legitimized these things. That's referring to subprime uh, asset-backed uh, CDOs. 
In other words, I'm going to put it together and it says, quote, you have legitimized these things that are leading people into dangerous risks. Another quote, if the, beating, if the ratings are BS, then the only use in the rating is comparing BS relative to more BS. That's not a satisfied customer, Mr. McDaniel. And it does not sound to me like you have the trust of the market. Without the trust of the market, what value do any of your organizations add to the financial system? Uh, it appears to be none. Mr. Uh, McDaniel, do you have the trust of the market? Uh, the trust in uh, uh, rating agencies and in Moody's um, has uh, obviously eroded um, during this period of credit turmoil. Um, I think it would be disingenuous not to acknowledge that, and I do. Um, we are working very hard to make sure that we can uh, reinstill uh, a sense of trust in the market uh, to support the confidence that market needs for the free flow of capital. Um, that is absolutely critical, and that is what we are focused on um, uh, as an organization uh, uh, very, very deeply. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have only five minutes, so I'd like to hear from the other gentlemen. If, if they think that they're investors, my constituents, you know, the word, the word credit comes from the Latin word credo, belief. They had belief in you. They had belief in your rating systems. And instead, they've lost some of my constituents, their entire retirements, their grandchildren's college funds. So I'm asking you, do you believe that uh, my constituents have trust in your ratings? We absolutely have to earn the credit back and, the, and the, as you said, and, and the credibility back and the trust back. We absolutely believe that. And, and that's why we have announced a number of actions that we believe we need to continue to add transparency bring more transparency in the marketplace to re-earn the trust of the investors, because ultimately it's the investors who use our ratings, and that's who we need to earn our trust back from. Sir? Uh, I'm also very disappointed in our inability to project uh, losses and uh, foresee the problems in the mortgage area and the CDO area. It's re resulted in a lot of rating changes that have changed valuations and prices and have impacted many people. So. Uh, so I realize our credibility has been damaged in that way. Uh, I, hopefully, people uh, recognize, at least my view is at Fitch, that we have operated with uh, objectivity, with best intentions, with no malintent, uh, although we weren't successful in projecting them. And so hopefully that's a foundation on which we can build uh, credibility again. It's my understanding from the earlier testimony that Standards & Poor's had in front of it a, an opportunity to upgrade its model in 2001. Sorry, that Standard & Poor's had, a, had, had in front of it a new modeling system. They knew the modeling system that they had didn't work and in 2001 made a decision because they didn't have enough money for staff and they didn't have enough money for uh, the computer upgrade to, to do the model, not to do that. Sir, was Standard & Poor's lacking in profits during that time? Congresswoman, uh, uh, Mr. Is your microphone on? Because I'm having trouble hearing you. Please be sure it's on. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, Mr. Rader had raised that point, and let me address, there were two points he raised. One was uh, that he, there was a new model that he was part of in terms of his development, but that model, a number of other analysts looked at it, and it did not conclude conclusively that it could improve the reliability or was a valid analytical approach, and so that's why we didn't choose to use it. The other point he raised was that the model that he was part of um, we, had, we have updated that about eight times since he has left Standard & Poor's. That's about two and a half times a year. So we update it almost two to three times a year, uh, and we continuously update it. As, and we will update that as frequently as the environment changes, the assumptions change, we will continue to update that. That's Mr. our commitment. Mr. Chair, if the staff could get that information, that in fact that they had aggressively pursued constantly updating their models uh, to meet the needs of what they saw in the changing uh, marketplace. That would be very helpful for the committee. We'd like to share what information we have about your operations so you can respond to the, uh, so we can sure. the facts that we know more about your company that uh, you, you're not aware of. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Um, would you say that the failure on the part of your companies to um, accurately assess the risk of these securities 
has contributed to the collapse of the financial markets that we've seen? Yes, no. Um, there are assumptions, as we have said, um, for example, in house price declines that we made, that they would decline by 10, 12, 12 15 percent. Certainly, the house price declines have been much more severe than we had anticipated. So, in that context, the risks of uh, in, in embedded in these instruments at a 30 percent house price declines is certainly higher than a 15 percent house price declines. Uh, I would suggest that having ratings move as volatilely as they have in the CDO and mortgage space impacts prices and has brought uh, people concerns about whether they will remain volatile or not. That has impacted uh, many people's valuations, banks, and of course uh, been a portion of the pressure put on them, yes. I guess I was suggesting something else. I will just draw the conclusion myself, which is that um, you encourage risky behavior because um, you rated these things as AAA or uh, reasonable investments when they weren't. And that set off a whole chain of events which resulted in the collapse of the financial markets and has had the human effect um, of a lot of people uh, losing their homes, of an increased tightening of credit and all the things that we are seeing. Um, I looked through the testimony of each of you. It didn't say, but um, I was just curious how long each of you have been in the positions that you hold right now. Uh, I started at, in the ratings business in 1975. I started at Fitch in 1989, and I became president in 1994. Uh, I began with Moody's in 1987, and I became CEO just over three years ago. I took on the role of president at Standard & Poor's last year in September. Last year, okay. Well, at least two out of three of you uh, were were there when a lot of this uh, this bad assessment uh, was occurring, and um, let me ask you this question: uh, Would you say that that people inside your agencies that these securities were so exotic, uh, so unusual, so fast moving in their design? That the, the fact of the matter is that there was really nobody who understood them completely. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, in the case of mortgage securities, I think uh, uh, they grew in complexity, but I believe our teams understood them well. In the case of CDOs, they also started more simply and got more complex. The uh, requirement to model their sophistication became more difficult. Mm -hmm. But if we were uncomfortable with our judgment on that, we would not have assigned ratings to them. Uh, my final example would be CPDOs, which also have been mentioned in the press as problematic uh, instruments. And there our teams studied those for more than six months. We had great debates within the organization uh, between the quantitative people who thought we could model the risk and some of our senior credit people who felt like the price performance was too short and the instruments too volatile. Uh, and after six months of healthy analytical debate, we chose not to rate them with either of our highest ratings, uh, and therefore we did no ratings. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because it's become a popular refrain in this to, to sort of say, oh, well, nobody really understood these things. Um, I've heard a number of you say today, well, you know, we built the models, but the models di didn't pick up on certain things. They were the wrong models and so forth. And I was counseled the other day by somebody uh, to resist that characterization um, and to believe that, in fact, there were people at all the various levels of this uh, drama who knew exactly what these instruments were, understood exactly what the risks of them were, um, but nevertheless proceeded to put a stamp on them at some level and just and just pass them along. And I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is uh, there had to be people inside of your agencies who were getting a sick feeling in the pit of their stomach as these things were coming across their desk. Um, and I don't understand why the, the company didn't have a culture that would trap that uneasiness and convert it into some real resistance to giving these, these high ratings to these securities. Can you explain that? I mean, so I would like to address that if okay. I could because I asked earlier if I could at least present Fitch's position in this matter. So 
I, I think there's a lot of examples where our credit culture has had us decline to rate securities uh, many times. So earlier it was suggested in 2004 that uh, we were nuts, I think was the term. Uh, I don't think so. In early 2003 or 4, uh, our credit teams decided that we were uncomfortable assigning our highest ratings to Alt-A securities. And so we weren't asked to rate any. Our market share dropped to zero as a consequence, which I think to me, and I certainly accept that and was aware of it, and was a consequence of the healthy analytical conclusion we reached, nothing to do with business. So there's structured investment vehicles uh, right. that were rated. I think the other rating agencies rated 40 or more. We rated five, I believe because it was well known in the market, our views, our credit views were more conservative and so we couldn't reach the higher rating conclusions that they expected. So, so I think uh, there's many examples. Uh, Ms. Norton, to, uh, Congressman uh, Norton, woman Norton uh, suggested earlier, uh, MBIA. We, we changed our rating in MBIA. I personally was involved in a quite contentious, contentious uh, public debate with the chairman of that company as to why we're changing our ratings. So I think there's a lot of examples uh, where our firm at least has demonstrated that when we have clear credit uh, concerns, then we either lower our ratings or we don't move forward with ratings. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Your time has expired. Um, Mr. Uh, chairman? Yes. Uh, how much time do I have remaining on behalf of the uh, ranking? We have three minutes and we have uh, one, one, two, three members. And I'll, I'll reserve. Side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time yet. Uh, Ms. Watson. It's hard to hear down at this end. Thank you so much. And uh, I just, and the committee just received a letter from our treasurer, Bill Lockyer, from the state of California, uh, my state. And in this letter, Lockyer is extremely critical of the way credit rating agencies are rating municipal bonds in California. Mr. Lockyer tells us that at the beginning of June of this year, S&P rated the credit, credit worthiness of both Lehman Brothers and the State of California. S&P gave them both A-plus ratings. Uh, we were 85 days before we got our budget and with a $14 billion shortfall. However, uh, just three months later, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. Now, here's what Lockyer says in the letter. How could any rational person believe that a long-term investment in Lehman Brothers was as safe as a long-term investment in California? That's one kind of quirky because we're in a little trouble. But something is amiss if a credit rating agency can give the same assessment. So I'd like to start with Mr. Sharma. Uh, can you please explain to me how S&P thought Lehman Brothers was such a safe bet that they gave it the same chances of defaulting as California. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, as you very well pointed out, uh, at that point in time, California's deficit and uh, budget shortfall was rising from up to about $22 to $23 billion. How did we get an A plus? Uh, but again, there was a, their ability to raise the capital. There are two re things we look at. One okay. is the capacity to pay and the other I'll buy is that. Willingness to pay. Same thing with now talk, turning to Lehman. Lehman, till that Friday before they, were, uh, before they went bankrupt, um, they were trying to raise capital. They were trying to um, uh, do, uh, divest some of their assets. And then they had the federal uh, government, Federal Reserve, as a backstop. And those were the reasons sort of why they felt they could still be an ongoing entity. Well, let me read you something that uh, Ms. Lockyer said in this letter. Without doubt, the rating agencies too freely assigned their highest ratings to structured investment products backed by mortgages and the debt of financial institutions, many of which have now collapsed. Some evidence suggests that the agencies may have cut corners and violated their own standards in doling out their ratings. So do you have a double standard where you give corporate bonds preferential treatment compared to municipal bonds, Mr. Sharma? No, Congresswoman. We have a single global consistent scale and we, rate, we strive to get a global consistency across all our asset classes over a long period of time. At any points in time, 
There are different credit cycles, there are different market cycles but across different asset classes, so there may be some differences. Well, I know we were in trouble in California with the largest state, majority of minorities, people come from Southeast Asia over the border with different needs that have to be met by government. But, uh, and, you, and you knew all the factors that were affecting California. Do you not do that same thing with Lehman Brothers? Because what I'm finding out, they misrepresented uh, their uh, standing, their liquidity and factors. And so I'm wondering if you evaluate them differently. We do look at different criteria. However, from a scale point of view, we look at them with the same uh, level of uh, criticality. Um, <clears throat> we had downgraded Lehman um, several weeks ago, and then we had even put them on, on credit watch negative, I believe, and we can confirm that to you. And the day before they went bankrupt, again, they were trying to raise capital, and they assured us that they had access to capital. They also... So were we. But anyway... Yeah, I understand. Even in California, the reason sort of we put them yeah. on negative, and we changed the rating yesterday, madam, because we saw they were able to raise the capital. Very good. But uh, I also understand from Mr. Locke here that uh, out of all the states, there's only been one state that defaulted. So I would think that our bond, bonding rate would uh, be uh, higher. Now, Mr. Chairman, one of the issues that concern many investors, particularly in the midst of the financial crisis, is the seemingly arbitrary meaning of credit ratings given by S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. Uh, I don't know how we are supposed to trust these ratings when junk bonds based on subprime mortgages receive triple A ratings, the same rating as the Federal uh, Treasury. And uh, I would ask all of you, but my time is up, uh, if the ratings have no meaning in relationship to each other, what really is their use? So uh, because my time is up, uh, maybe we can send out and ask you know, what these standards are, how they are applied to municipal bonds, and if you can all answer that in writing, we'll send you the question in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Watson. We'll hold the record open for a response. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to get some clarification uh, as to the real meaning you intend of ratings, uh, particularly in light of the disclaimers that I've found in uh, the works and the in the um, yes. documents of all of you. Um, your companies are very profitable for the reasons that people put their money on you, in effect. And you see how profitable you are. Uh, the three firms doubled uh, in, uh, from 2002 to 2007, increasing from $3 billion to $6 billion. This will go down in history. This was the period <laughs> during which the government flushed down into the you-know-what. At Moody's, uh, the profits quadrupled between 2000 and 2007. In fact, Moody's had the highest profit margin of any company on the S&P. 500 for five years in a row. And the reason that you're so profitable is because so many investors rely on your expertise and your ratings as virtual gospel scripture, whatever you want to call it. They point to them time and again. Uh, but to hear the disclaimers and the caveats and the qualifications you would think that the credit ratings aren't worth the paper they're written on. Let me, let me find out. Ms. Sharma, here's a disclaimer from uh, S&P Includes in its materials. The credit ratings and observations contained herein are solely statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, hold, or sell any securities or make any other investment decisions. Uh, written by somebody in my law school class, I'm sure, <laughs> but from the point of view of an investor. What does it mean? All right, here's Mr. McDonald, uh, Mr. McDaniel's uh, uh, disclaimer from Moody's. Similar statement, the credit ratings and financial reporting analysis observations are and must be construed solely 
as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities. My, my, my. Now, Mr. Joint, not to leave you out, Fitch's code of conduct goes perhaps the furthest. This is what it says. Rulings are not themselves facts and therefore cannot be described as either accurate or inaccurate. Now, from where I come from, this sounds like double speak. Mr. Joint, how can you say that your ratings are neither accurate or inaccurate? Uh, well, I'm not sure of the legal definition and why it was created in that way, accurate or inaccurate. Sorry? Uh, I think we are emphasizing the fact that our ratings are uh, uh, our opinions and they're uh, they're formulated by people that have done the best they can with good faith to look at all the analysis they can. The ratings can change over time, and they do. Uh, and it's better that we disclose the fact that there are opinions uh, as clear as we can. Well, anything anybody says is an opinion, unless it's a scientific fact. We do understand that. But, Mr. Joyner, if you rate, let's get, let me give you a hypothetical. If you rate a group of bonds as AAA and those bonds fail, would you say that that rating was accurate or inaccurate? Well, I would say that it did not project the kind of risk that uh, investors, that our ratings were intended Look, to I'm project. I'm asking you about your rating. Would Pardon? you say it was accurate or inaccurate? Uh, I would say it, it did not reflect the risk. The AAA was designed to reflect a high degree of uh, likelihood of repayment of principal and interest. And if it so failed, it was inaccurate? If it failed to do that, Was it I, inaccurate or accurate? I suppose inaccurate. I, I mean, I just a ask this because most investors will will approach this with a high degree of, of reliance and, and the three of you seem to be having it not both ways but always. Um, on the one hand, the legal uh, uh, disclaimers uh, saying people shouldn't rely on what you say because it's your opinion, it can't possibly be accurate or inaccurate. On the other hand, you are telling investors and they're paying because they believe you. That's why I quoted how profitable you are, that you have the best methodology and the best rating record and the most expertise, so they should pay you billions of dollars and they comply. So let me ask each of you a question. Do you think your companies in any way uh, are responsible for what has happened to our economy? Well, I, I attempted to answer that question earlier from the standpoint of uh, the ratings volatility uh, and the downgrades, since we weren't able to project, you know, forward this crisis and housing coming, uh, would have impacted prices of securities, and that would have contributed to the volatility in the market, which has contributed to the crisis. So I certainly. So do you all do you all accept that. some responsibility uh, for what has happened to the economy, given the reliance of investors, ordinary people, and others on your ratings? Do you take some responsibility? General ladies, time has expired, but I want to give uh, each of you an opportunity further to answer uh, the question. Uh, with respect to the, the current... Is uh, your microphone button Yes, on? it is. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with respect to this crisis, um, I think there are responsible parties throughout the marketplace. Uh, Including yourselves. That includes the credit rating agencies and Moody's. Mm -hmm. um, our opinions were our best opinions based on the information we had at the time, but they have had to change rapidly. Uh, and on much more of a wholesale basis than uh, we would like to see, obviously. Mr. Sharma? Absolutely. And when you look at the role we play, which is to provide credit opinions, and the assumptions we made that underlie that it did not turn out to the way we expected it to be. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Spear? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to each of you for participating today. You know, Consumer Reports is a, a rating agency. And it rates appliances and cars and electronics. And it's well regarded by the consuming public because it's scrupulous about not engaging in conflicts of interest. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Um, who do you owe a fiduciary duty to? The issuer or the investor? And just answer it with one word. Mr. Joint? Uh. 
I don't know fiduciary responsibility. I'm not sure I can answer that question. So I feel quite responsible to provide our best opinion to investors and everyone in the market. I don't feel a special responsibility to issuers. Mr. McDaniel. Uh, the responsibility is ultimately to the marketplace. Um, Can we you cannot say investor? To the market. Not to the investor, to the market. The, the investor is an absolutely critical component of an effectively functioning marketplace, and so we must be responsible to the investor. Uh, we also have a responsibility to the overall uh, good operation of the markets themselves. All right, Mr. Sharma. Yeah, um, trust is the life and blood of our franchise, and we see ourselves as a bridge between the issuers and the investors. It's and just so answer the question. Credibility Issuer with the investors is the most critical thing for us. All right. Do any of you accept gifts from issuers, dinners, golfing, trips, contributions to your conferences? Uh, uh, and then we have a gift policy, which I believe we provided to uh, the committee as well. So I, I believe it limits so what gifts. What is it? I believe it limits gifts to $25 or. Uh, so you don't go out to dinner with any of those that are your clients? Uh, you don't go golfing? You don't. Uh, I'm, I'm they don't contribute to conferences you host around the country? Okay, I'm not sure about contribute to conferences or whether we've ever co hosted conferences with. Uh, either investors or issuers or industry groups. I'm not, right. uh, Mr. I'm not certain about that. Uh, I do have uh, meals uh, occasionally with investors uh, and issuers, um, uh, in including uh, uh, issuers who are, are themselves uh, uh, governments uh, around the world. Um, I do not uh, engage in any other entertainment uh, or accept gifts from. Uh, well, I'm those talking entities. about your company. Do you allow? Yes, we have a gift policy similar to uh, what Mr. Joint just described, and I believe we have made that available. Um, and uh, my recollection is it's a $100 limit uh, on gifts. And they don't contribute to conferences you have around the country? Uh, I don't believe they do, but I would have to go back right. and check to Thank see whether you, there's any co-hosting of conferences. We'll ask you to do that through yeah. Mr. The, the Chairman. Mr. Sharma? We, similarly, as, as both Mr. McDonald said and Mr. Joint, we have gift policy, which we have made you know, available to you. After. All right. Um, is it true that as a result of legislation you sought and supported, I believe in 2007, maybe in 2006, that um, as a result of that legislation you no longer can be sued by the taxpayers? Sorry. Say this again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know the answer right. to that. Thank you. Um, let's move on then to AIG. <clears throat> Each of you, or one of you, rated AIG as double A two days before it went bankrupt. How can you square that rating with the condition of the company at the time? Mr. Sharma. Uh, first of all, um, uh, AIG uh, ratings has continued to be changed over the last several years. Three years ago it was triple A and then it was downgraded to double A. But let's just talk about it sure. in that week before right. it went bankrupt. Correct. And the taxpayers of this country are now on the hook for over $100 billion. You had rated them as A, a or double A. We, our analysts, w had projected some economic losses for AIG, which they had got a similar independent view from a third party as what those economic losses were. But then when the Fannie and Freddie Mac issues happened, the spreads widened, and as the spreads widened, they had to uh, report a greater uh, mark to market losses on their books. As they did that, that created even more pressure on them, and as a result, they had to go raise more capital, and that became a we challenge. We understand for them. all that. Did, did but you, but did you raise any questions about the credit default swaps? We, we, we do. We had uh, taken into account of that and put a capital charge against them. But as the uh, our markets unfolded so quickly, their ability to raise capital and liquidity sort of quickly shut off from them, and as a result, they got in, the spreads widened on them, and they had to put more losses on their books, and so things moved very cliff quickly on them. And as it moved quickly, and in fact, the Friday of that day of that week, I believe we already sort of put them on credit watch negative, recognizing these issues were starting to come up. Two days before they were double A. Thank you, Ms. Spear. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, 
when the story is told about this debacle, there will be uh, a lot of blame to go around to the private sector, the public sector, the HUD, Congress, but it doesn't relieve any of us from the particulars of, of what each of us, our roles were. Tell me, first off, uh, do you believe that your company's brand, you, that you've lost because of the incredible failures that have taken place, that you, your company brand is pretty low, number one, and I want to know if each of you think that. I think you've lost your company, I think you've lost your brand. I don't, I'll tell you what I think, I want to know if you agree. That you have no credibility, that uh, you have so screwed up uh, the, uh, the ratings as to not be believable anymore. Do you think that's true? I'll ask each of you. So uh, I said earlier, I think our, our reputation has been damaged by our inability to project uh, the ratings and the risk of mortgage and CDOs. I also feel like uh, we accomplish a lot of credible work in other areas. That's not what I asked yet, though. <laughs> so Thank it, it has been damaged, yep. yes. Uh, yes, I think there has been reputational damage, and uh, I think it's going Serious to Serious reputation damage or just little reputation damage? Serious reputation damage in the areas that have, have been under stress, absolutely. Mr. Sharma? Well, absolutely, we, and we have to own our credibility back. Well, what possibly would make um, us feel comfortable that you can gain it back? Uh, one of the things that's come across to me is the, the comments that that these instruments are, uh, CDOs are so complex and that each of you view them differently, and, and, and. Uh, what makes us think you can get on top of this? Mr. Sharma? Well, I, we have um, announced a number of actions earlier this year uh, to improve our analytics and, and bring more transparency and information disclosure to the marketplace and put new governance and control procedures in place to make sure that there's a confidence in, in our process. And, and now, as well as go to the marketplace with some education to the investors as to what we're doing. And Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I'd like to sort of put our uh, recommendations or actions that we've taken into record, if, if that uh, you would, would consider that. Would your answers that. be different? We'd be happy different. to receive them. Either of your answers different? Uh, not substantially different. So I, I think uh, I would answer by saying that uh, we at Fitch also now have a healthy skepticism about the complexity of instruments and the use of quantitative models to try to assess those. So I said earlier in my testimony that uh, we need to both revisit our models, uh, seek to rate less complex instruments, and bring a healthy degree of experience and let, art to the process. Let me ask you, what is the guarantee that you won't, in order to try to prove your worth, go in the exact opposite direction. You, you all were on a feeding frenzy. I mean, uh, Moody's went from 30 million to 113 million uh, in just four years uh, dealing with CDOs, uh, asset-backed securities. I mean, this was a feeding frenzy. What is there to convince us that you won't now to compensate for being so wrong uh, that you won't be so wrong the other way. I think the I think the um, uh, first and best uh, means of of judging the balance of our opinions um, will be to um, look to the methodologies uh, for investors uh, and the marketplace to uh, judge the quality of those methodologies and to whether we are adhering to them, um, and that over time. Uh, will show uh, whether we have uh, 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 achieved the proper balance. I agree with you. We cannot go overboard the other direction. That is not helpful either. Uh, let me uh, understand. Um, would you all agree with that answer? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. And in fact, if you look at even now in today's environment, when things are so uh, fragile and unstable, we get calls for that we are too quick in some cases and, and not too quick in other cases. So we get sort of uh, uh, comments on both sides that, you know, you're not taking enough rating action, and in other cases, you're taking too many rating actions. So we, and we have to always stay consistent and objective. Is it, is it conceivable that you will look at an instrument and say, we just simply don't understand it? 
We have. We have done that, and we have chosen not to rate instruments where we have not felt comfortable. As your, uh, I, I made reference to uh, Moody's uh, increases in revenues from 30 million to 113 million in two, by 207 to 204. Would those uh, percentages be about the same, or tripling, uh, be about the same uh, uh, with um, with you, uh, uh, Mr. Sharma? I'm sorry, well, Congressman. You, can you ask the question again? In other words, Moody's uh, n had an increase in revenues of 29,800, 29 million 800 thousand, so on, up to 113 million uh, 17. So from 29 million to 13 million. On, on its CDOs, the yeah. income, has yours gone up about that amount? I mean, it's a huge increase. Yeah. And it suggests that there was a feeding frenzy, yeah. candidly. I, I, I cannot answer this. Uh, we can get back the data specifically sure. to you, but we did see an increase during that time period. I, I can't tell you whether it was the same amount or similar. Tripling. Yeah. Is, that, is that true as well for you, Mr. So, uh, uh, we had submitted this uh, data, I think, to the committee and looking at what we had submitted. And for U.S. CDOs, I believe our revenues were $24 million in 01 and $22 million in 02. And by 2007, 2007 uh, it was $37 million. That's all? Uh, yeah, that's what we've submitted. So it, it may be that we're not comparing apples to apples on this. Pardon me? It may be we're not comparing apples to apples. Well, our. Uh, you I believe our market share is significantly lower, or it was okay. a third of the yeah, market right. share uh, of yes, Moody's and Standard & Poor's. With companies right now, you rate instruments, you rate companies. Do you just withdraw everything since you, you were so wrong? And by the way, I'm speaking as someone who's part of an institution that has an unfavorable rating lower than yours, so uh, I, I realize I'm here looking down. Uh, but it's not lost on me where we're at. But um, do, you, do you withdraw, given that you were so wrong, do you go back, are you going back and looking at past um, appraisals and uh, re-examining them, or are you just saying we're starting fresh from here? So if I could address that, Mr. Uh, Congressman Chase, I tried to address it in my testimony as well. The ratings themselves, having been lowered dramatically, were reflective of the probability of full repayment of principal and interest. Once they become below investment grade, they're less useful to investors. They've lost the confidence of full repayment. So what we've tried to do is focus our analysis on, well, what is the portion of likely payment? And there's widely uh, divergent likelihoods on different securities, 90 cents, 85, 62. Uh, and so I think that can be more a shift that could be helpful in illuminating for investors the risk. Yeah, what, what I'm just asking, though, is I'm asking damage done, are you going back and looking at how you have rated different instruments and saying we need to take a second look at them? Absolutely. And I'm asking each of you. Yeah, we continuously look at our methodology, learn from the experience and say no, what can no, we but change? I'm not asking if you're getting paid again to do it. I'm asked if you're going back and saying we were so wrong, we didn't earn that payment, uh, we need to go back and check so that those who rely on our information will have better information. No, it's part of our same uh, uh, commitment to them to continue to do what we had agreed to do for the de rate debt we rated. Uh, as conditions change and, and uh, credit risk uh, indicators change, we absolutely must go back and change uh, ratings to accommodate that. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for being here and for your testimony. I want to conclude by uh, commenting on the fact that between 2002 and 2007, we have seen this explosion of, uh, of securities and collateralized debt obligations backed by risky subprime loans. And it was important to those who were involved in these new, very complicated securities to get the ratings that would allow them to sell them. And in doing so, they, they didn't simply ask you for the ratings. They worked very closely with you in designing the way they would structure the finance deals so that they could get the ratings. And, and, um, and you gave them uh, ratings, and in many cases, AAA ratings that people relied on. Now the bottom has fallen out. And we uh, are paying an enormous consequence in our economy. Uh, and I do 
submit to you that uh, this has been very profitable for the rating companies and for the executives as well. But uh, it could be because you got higher fees when you, when you rated some of these uh, securities backed by a pool of home loans. But I think we've seen this failure of the credit rating agencies to help the consumers make a decision. And I just want to review some of the key phrases used in your own documents. We drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, Fitch and S&P went nuts. No one cared because the machine just kept going. We sold our soul to the devil for revenue. It could be structured by cows and we would rate it. Let's hope we are all retired by the time this house of cards falters. Any request for loan level tapes is totally unreasonable. Well, these are the things we got from the documents from your businesses. And each one shows a complete breakdown in the credit rating agencies. So I, uh, I, I think that uh, we have a very disturbing picture. Uh, you weren't the only ones at fault, but you were the gatekeepers and you worked very closely with others who were benefiting as well. The explosion of these new, very complicated securities is something very new, but we also have something that's very old, uh, greed and self-interest pushing forward a lot of people to do things that uh, in, in hindsight, certainly they would they regret having done, but also you would have thought that since it was all, since this was all based so much on very, very um, shaky undergirdings of these uh, loans that um, one would have thought that maybe somebody should have stood back and said, well, wait a minute, as did some of the people in your, in your companies. Uh, we're, we're, we're holding these hearings uh, uh, because we want to learn what happened and get something worthwhile out of all of this for reforms for the future. And I think, uh, as you've all indicated, reaching reforms will be needed to restore any confidence in the credit rating business. Uh, Mr. Shays, do you want to make any I just want to comments? thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings. I just think the quotes you read are just uh, the essence of why we have no faith in this process. And you should be congratulated for holding these hearings and for the conduct of all your members. Thank you. I th I thank you very much, Mr. Shays, for your kind words. And I, I do appreciate the conduct of all of our members in pursuing these, these issues. They're very important. Uh, I know this has not been a comfortable day for you. But I think you are well aware that uh, we've got to work together to, to restore the system that will benefit uh, the, the economy and, and the people who make the investments. So I thank you again. That concludes our business, and we stand adjourned. The House Government Reform and Oversight Committee continues its hearings on financial markets at 10 o'clock Eastern.